Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mambo number five. This is Podkit, episode 36, really into Mambo number five, on Monday, February 19th, 2018. And now, neither white noise nor vents. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk36. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey. How's it going? It's going pretty well. How about you guys? It's going pretty pretty well. Going great. So we have a few things on our topics today. Um, I think when you guys put this first one in. So, you know... um, we all we all kind of work and in, in various environments. So, um, mostly mostly we work in office settings. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask you guys about disruptions and distractions while at work. So, I know that when I work at home, I can actually focus on some more abstract thinking. Like, it's easier for me to if I don't need to discuss like what to do or how to do something. It's easier for me to think about how to structure code sort of at home because it's quieter and there's less people asking me questions about other things that I'm not trying to think about. And when I'm at work, I notice that, you know, there's, there's various things that will distract me. So, um, when I, when we made these show notes, you know, weeks and weeks ago, because that's how it is, Bitbucket and NPM had gone down a couple of days prior um, and then a few days later, GitHub and Slack had major outages as well. And those were productivity drains, let's just say. So what do you guys think about that, those kinds of things? Yeah, for sure. So uh, it's not often that I work from home. Usually, like, for example, if, I, if I'll have, like, a doctor's appointment or something and it'll take out just enough of a day that it might not make sense for me to go back into work, I'll finish out the day at home or something like that, or if there's inclement weather... But I guess like the the difference between working from home and working at work, uh, I think, as you mentioned, is like kind of one of environment. So I set up my workspace at home uh, a little bit differently than I do my workspace at work. And my workspace at home is definitely a little bit more focused towards kind of focused work, I guess. Uh, Mm -hmm. Whereas my my workspace at work is very much like I, I have papers scattered all around like some kind of a professor or something. And I, I've got a couple extra monitors that I don't have at home and various stuff like that, right? And I guess I think you're tapping into something when you mention that, like, um, you can think a little bit more abstractly when you have kind of more, a quiet or more focused work environment. Yeah, for sure. So I I prefer working at work. My desk at home, I think, is a little larger, but there's more open space on my desk at work. I keep it very neat. You know, I have monitor arms, so it just kind of keeps things out of the way. Um, I, I'm kind of, so I have the one lone standing desk in the middle of an aisle. So there aren't, and there are windows behind me. So there aren't people to my left or right. There are people across from me and my, my whole team's there. So I do talk with them, but I find it's more worthwhile to be in the office to do things because if I do need help with something or to discuss something, my team is there and I can talk with them right away rather than having to schedule a, a call or something else. Um, or talk to them on slack oh yeah i i totally agree with that like it's so much easier so i i pretty much only work from home once a week or every other week or so primarily because it is just so much easier to talk to people to you know figure what out whatever whatever we're trying to do out but but when i do work at home i notice the difference um about that ability to actually think about something in the abstract i i work from home maybe once every month or two the last time was that big snowfall in january right same I was, home. I was home for for two days actually or no one day and then a half day later in the week but i find when i'm working at home yes i'm not distracted by other people but i don't you know i get distracted with myself more often i feel like i'm like oh i should go i'll do all the dishes you know or i'll feel like well i just did, got some stuff done. i'll do something else or you know i'll pull my phone and check twitter you know more things that I I wouldn't do at work so much that I I feel like I I hold myself more accountable at work. Now there has been some times where I have worked from home and I've gotten a lot done, but I don't feel like I couldn't have done that at work either. 
I can put on headphones and just pretty much go at it for an afternoon. If I really wanted to not be distracted, I could little send a little message saying, hey, I'm going to work on this. Maybe uh, schedule an event that just tells my whole team, don't bug me for the whole afternoon kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Or I could go into a little enclave and be on my own. There are some r- rooms that just one or two chairs that I could sit at too. Nice. Yeah, I think another thing that is probably worth mentioning is that I have a significant portion of my week goes to meetings and calls with clients or calls with vendors or something like that. And it's okay to take those calls from home for sure. But I think generally speaking, I almost always prefer if I'm like in the room with the other people at my company who are on the call, just because there's there's a lot of discussion that can happen that is it's so that you can uh make funny faces at each other (laughs) when they say something absurd on the other side of the phone uh no comment but uh the (laughs) the, you know like the the biggest the biggest thing about that right is that when you're on a call with somebody like that it can be really hard to tell how every how everyone else is is thinking or feeling or reacting body language is is important you know Right, right 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 like if i say something totally ridiculous which of course never happens but if it, let's say it were, I could I could see that people were like, oh, that's that's not how we thought this was going to be implemented in the UI. So let's you know let's fix that, and then I can know immediately that that was incorrect, and vice versa. And same same sort of thing, we can kind of like know where we're at without tripping over each other, which I think is really valuable for stuff like that. I guess to your to your question about like when services are unavailable, stuff like Bitbucket, npm, GitHub, and Slack. I think for us like. Slack is kind of tricky because it's a really important way for us to communicate across offices, so like across coasts and whatnot. But we have GitHub Enterprise. So for us, the the bigger thing than even GitHub.com going down is often when we have GitHub Enterprise plan maintenance. And sometimes that'll happen during the workday. Usually it won't, but sometimes it does. And then when NPM goes awry, then so does the rest of the world. So that's definitely a uh, a whole other level of, of, of difficulty, I think. Yeah, we also have GitHub Enterprise. I think internal stuff going down would affect us more than a lot of external things. We have an internal artifactory server, which uh, hosts NPM packages and things, but you know, not every application is pointed at that. Um, so NPM, I think, would affect us as it would everyone else. When Slack went down, I probably lost productivity just because I'm a, a, a Slack person and I was actually developing a script that integrates with Slack at the exact moment, I I basically clicked merge and then Slack went down. Oh no! I thought it was me for a half second, but it was a little larger than that, so that was good. You broke it, Brian. You broke Slack. <laughs> but yeah, Slack Slack is more at my work used for cross team um, communication and help, and so I I really try to follow along and do it to keep up with everyone else and see what else is going on within the company. Totally. I'm in something like forty teams or forty channels at work. That's insane. And I, I'm just a, I'm a lurker. I'm not super high in terms of messages per month, but I lurk. Well, I'll tell you something that I just just did with HipChat. So for Doherty, I have the Doherty Slack, of course, um, and I think maybe I'm in fifteen ish, maybe so, something around there. And so, like, of course, some two of those are general and random, and then there's a bunch of MSP specific channels that I'm in, and then a few private channels for just different teams that I've been a part of. But then at my client, we use HipChat, and it's gotten to the point where I'm in enough channels and there's enough off-topic content relative to my current work that I have changed the default notification setting from, I don't know, make a weird noise whenever it whenever there's any activity to only make a weird noise when there's activity directly involving me. Yeah. Yep. I've done that for a couple of channels. There are, there are just like a small handful of people that have been doing table flip gifs and things in our random channel and that you know that alerts like 700 people and that's that's a lot well i i've turned off um notifications for general and random at this point yeah if they're not going to at me it's not at me then <laughs> the worst day was when they posted 150 uh animal gifs and pictures in random in like an hour span it was awful then they made a pets channel and i was happy oh <laughs> <laughs> so good yeah distractions on slack are an issue sometimes it depends on the day i guess some days are pretty quiet and some are way more active but all in all i think it's a good thing to have and it's super useful i I hardly use skype for business anymore oh well i mean like skype for business is intentionally crippled where i am so we don't <laughs> we don't get to use it really 
and that's a good thing. Yeah, pretty much. So that that brings up a good point. So when you when you have uh, you know Slack and HipChat and whatever crazy things people use these days, so like what happens to us quite often is that some of the team will have a meeting that runs over our daily standup. So what do you do then? Do you do you just hip chat or slack the the standup notes uh back to the team or do you reschedule the standup just in general? Like so what what do you guys think? The only thing that would cause like someone to not go to a stand up is if they're coming into work late for me. Our stand ups are at either nine fifteen or nine forty five, so there's usually not too much going on then. If it's just one or two people, it would just they just miss it and they do it again in, in two more days if everyone was gone they it probably would just get canceled and not be not be done at all. What, what was that about two more days what's that we do ours on monday wednesday friday oh my gosh that's amazing i love it let's do it that is pretty awesome i think for us something that's kind of interesting is like we are our like stand-up time is pretty flexible it's kind of like when everybody shows up that's when we do a stand-up so it's it's not so much like like there's a calendar event for it, but oftentimes there are you know calls that start at eight thirty that don't end until nine fifteen or exactly something like that. And nine nine fifteen is usually when we'd want to do stand up. What do you guys have going on at eight thirty? Meetings. Nothing ever happens yep. at my work before nine ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's like unspoken rule: don't ever schedule anything that early. No, so that so so basically what's happened is there are so many meetings that if people are entering the general working hours from like you know nine to four that people have started encroaching on you know 11 30 to one or noon and then noon to 12 30 and then from three to five and then from seven until nine like people have started to schedule meetings then so that they can have a meeting yeah right our team is pretty good about not having too many meetings for a while we had meetingless fridays where it only have a stand-up and anything that's you know no one within the team would actively schedule something unless it was super urgent for that friday i sometimes would if it was just like a quick one-on-one thing and i kind of like meaningless fridays that's good too (laughs) (laughs) but i guess this all brings up something kind of uh related but maybe perhaps a little bit distinct from here which is um the open plan office would you say that uh you all work in what you would consider an open plan office yes yes Gotcha. So I guess like for the listener, what I kind of view as an open plan office is something where nobody really has a separate cubicle, I guess, as you might want to call it, but everyone kind of has desks and you can generally speaking, see more or less across the office and herds and herds of developers, herds and herds of developers. Yeah. It it seems to be a pretty common thing Where, where I work. We have, you know, we all have these like glass desks so you know basically anyone can sit at any desk if they if they wish and we usually do like a seating chart revamp from time to time but generally speaking people are now seated by department so i'm next to all the other engineers media folks are next to all the other media folks stuff like that now a thing that's kind of interesting about this is i guess like the design behind this is that if i'm an engineer and another engineer is working on a thing and i'm working on a different thing and they overhear one of us talking about something and and it's something that this person knows about that can kind of jump in and be like, oh, hey, have you have you tried using, you know, whatever the new zero conf web pack thing is, right? They, they can kind of suggest things or p- people are kind of like generally aware of what's going on with everybody at all times. At least that's, what's, that's what the design seems to be. The result of that can often be uh, a little bit removed from that. So I know, for example, I really rely on my headphones a lot when I want to like focused work on something and other other people you know sometimes will just like go to another place if they need to work in a really focused fashion on something how do you guys react to that and to what degree do you guys see this as a as a good thing or something that maybe needs a little bit of adjustment yeah so i've been on many different teams in many different room sizes in many different offices now and so it depends on a few different factors it depends on how loud your group is it depends on how small or large the room is and it depends on how many other people can be annoyed by you (laughs) um very fair so um where i am now it's a we're we're in the corner of a very large room i mean it's like this room is a third of the visible space on this building well on this floor anyway so it's interesting we we have often talked and uh, you know about about finding like just a big conference room instead 
to go in um, because then we would be able to not need to uh, be as quiet when we're talking about things on the whiteboard or if we're if we want to just have a call with somebody we don't have to go into another room anyway we would just be there on the other hand when I'm like so what Brandon was talking about like this this idea of overhearing and then immediately being able to say like hey I can help with that so that's me that's what I do yeah. I hear everything and I can react instantly but on the other hand what's bad about that is that's not my job actually totally um and I guess I've realized that over time so like that that was one of the great things that I was able to do for everybody at Doherty and at my client like I can just help with anything anytime but if I'm actually supposed to be doing something, that's quite a distraction. So it's it's a it's a problem too. And so like I don't I don't listen to music like normal people. So like headphones don't really do anything for me. And I can wear the noise canceling headphones, but I'd rather just not be in the environment with people talking about stuff that I'm not supposed to be concerned with. At my place or at my work, <laughs> um, it's your place. It's not. Yeah, it is my place. I'm there a lot, that's for sure. We we talk to each other quite a bit, or it's nice to be able to listen in on other conversations that are happening of, you know, like some server environment has been having issues, what, you know, hearing people trying to debug it and talk about talk about it. I find that interesting, and it's good to keep, keep up to date with that kind of stuff. But yeah, it can be a little distracting, too, with hearing all these other people. I'm pretty good about tuning it out when I need to, and if I really need to get down into it, I'll put on headphones. But otherwise, I can kind of tune things out without putting on headphones if I need to as well. Uh, we do have some white or pink noise speaker generator things in the ceiling, so that helps keep sound from traveling super far. See, I really want that. Can I have that? That sounds so nice. That is pretty awesome. You should you should get it. It's pretty nice. Yeah, it 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 makes so the little enclaves that I've mentioned earlier. You know, it's a little sliding glass door, and there's a either like a high top table with some chairs or a couch and a another little sofa chair kind of thing yep. and there are no generators in there and so you get in that room and you close the door and you're like it's so quiet so it's crazy so is is that white noise generator thing is that like a like an air vent or is it actually like a speaker it looks like like a like a small little speaker looking thing so we have um so our our, our areas by the by the windows where they have the air vents i guess and so sometimes the air vents stop blowing the air as strongly for some reason and then the whole floor gets so much louder because it's not white noise but it's you know air noise and so it's so weird when it happens yeah for us we have uh neither vents nor white noise generators we just have the sonos (laughs) which is which is kind of the same thing but a little bit different so basically anyone in the company can play music uh anywhere at any time which is blessing and definitely from time to time a curse. I remember when I had just started, there was somebody who was, for whatever reason, really into the song Mama Number no. 5, <laughs> uh, which you might remember from like 1999 to 2003 Disney radio. That was my favorite song. My cousins had it on a karaoke <laughs> machine. It was the best. Oh, right? Yeah. Uh, but it was the sort of thing where like people would just play, wh- whoever this was would just like play it and then... Uh, somebody would stop it and then they'd play it again so it would just be like ladies and gentlemen this is mama number five and then that would be it and then they just start it and stop it at different places and it was it was just totally ridiculous it was hilarious for the first 30 seconds but then they kept it going for just like months months yeah exactly <laughs> uh and it would be the sort of thing where like you'd have a, a, a really good day right where like people like there wouldn't be much sonos trolling right and then all of a sudden you just hear Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mama number five. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> and, you know, there's definitely still a little bit of that going on, but I think it's been drastically reduced over time, I think. Uh, don't ever remind anybody about that ever. Oh, right, exactly, because nobody knows who it is. So my, my coworker and I, we were, one of the things that we sketched out was like a, a Sonos interface, right? So like basically a, a way that people could only access Sonos is if they use this authenticated application. So then if somebody did something stupid, like um, play Mamba number five 37 times, we would know about it and we could, you know, we could set up triggers for certain things so that like if somebody played Mamba number five more than once in an hour, we'd send an email to the whole company that said, hey, so-and-so is being a jerk on Sonos and we've locked them out because the only thing that works better than actual access control 
is public humiliation, as as we all know, right? <laughs> That's so genius. I love it. <laughs> I yeah. don't even know how to type that in as a title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there were at least four show titles that came back oh. in that. Oh my gosh! There. But you know, there, there's some really fun stuff that can happen there too. One of my favorite things to do with uh, Sonos, because of course, like Sonos is something that's very like, um, you know, dominated by people who like the kind of prevailing popular kind of music. Occasionally, there are like really ridiculous or, or strange or offbeat covers of those things. So you know, for example, for every Wonderwall by Oasis, there's Wonderwall by the Mike Flowers Pop, which is like a James Bond kind of sleazy singer like crooner version of uh of, of the song by oasis i recently found and i'll put this in the show notes uh there's a gucci gang you guys are familiar with the song gucci gang right gucci gang gucci gang gucci gang uh what was the snl one a few weeks ago uh, tucci gang with, tucci, uh, yes. about stanley tucci yeah that was yes. pretty good um i'm gonna see if i can find here there's like a um somebody did like a a cover of gucci gang that was like way more chill hop um so it was you know I'll, I'll i'll just find it it's it's hard to explain but basically somebody played gucci, gucci gang on sonos and i couldn't help of course but play this this cover of it and people were just like wait didn't we just hear this song you know i feel like that stuff's kind of kind of reasonable but of course i do because i do it from time to time it's it's kind of a fun way to keep the company kind of all on the same page or not thinking too seriously but also kind of sometimes it's really annoying particularly when people mess with the volume so yeah, I've definitely thought about <laughs> putting on just like a white noise soundtrack on the Sonos for that reason. So I think I found the what looks to be like the the product they have at my work. Uh-huh. It's a pro acoustics uh, commercial sound system for sound masking. That's nice. cool. So they're just small little things. Look like it's power over Ethernet and you just like zip an Ethernet cable along. Yeah. Yeah, works really well. Totally recommend it. Man, these show notes are going to be really weird for somebody. They are. Somebody's going to read these and be like, how did this happen? Gucci gang and Tucci gang. Well, I think uh, I think Brian's part of the, the uh, React gang now. I can finally listen to old episodes of PodKit and understand what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> well, I'm glad you can get it now because I still don't. W- would would um, you say that you're reacting natively? Oh, no. Uh, it's not native yet, no. It's, uh, it's still going through... <laughs> Well, uh, TypeScript this time, not Babel. Nice. So I started using React a bit at work. I think I mentioned it a little bit in the last podcast, right? We recorded one in January, I think. So this is true. I've done a little bit by then. I did more, and I've done more, and I've done training at work for it. So I've done even more. Isn't that cute? You actually get training for some technology that you get to use. That's so cute. It's the first time they've done something quite like this. It was a three-day thing. I think that they just hired someone on as an architect from one of the teams at the, at the company. Nice. And his, yeah, his you like, mentioned that. It was first his, thing, his yeah. first day was doing React training. Wasn't that the uh, enterprise architect? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of those. That's so, so funny. <laughs> uh, it went well. Uh, we got pizza on the last day, so that was pretty good. And now I'm applying some of it to uh, like an admin tool at work. And a couple things came up that... I was struggling with, and I'll just briefly tell you about them in case you are interested. Um, so the first one was like, so I was basically the only feature it does now, other than a little bit of security and loading a profile picture on a nav bar, is there's a number input where you type in a like an ID, which is a key in a table, and you hit submit, and then it displays the information in a nice stringified JSON in like a, a pretext area. And that's that's all it does. It's just a way of us looking up some debugging information. But I could not figure out how to have this number input allow you to delete characters so you can type something else. Because in... So React has controlled and uncontrolled inputs. You guys are familiar with all that? Yeah. Yes. But go over it briefly for the audience. Yes. So a controlled input means React is maintaining the state. So when you when you make a component, you have um, a property on your state there that is referring to a particular input. So I had one called state ID. So... You would uh, set the value of that input to be state ID, and then you would have an on change uh, event, which would, which you would then handle, and you'd say, okay, here's the new value from the event. I'm going to set the state to be that value. So what happens is when you change that input, it's not your, it's not so much the DOM storing the state. It's React saying, okay, here's the state. Now I'm going to set that element to be what you just typed. So it's the thing in charge of the state. Uncontrolled means that DOM element stores what 
uh, its current state is. And you can access it through a, a reference where you, when you change that DOM element, it'll set a property on your component to be a reference to that DOM element and all of its properties and methods on the element. So with a number input, I was having issues where I was on my change handler, I would run the value through the number, what is it, number constructor? So it would turn it into a number. And I only wanted to allow positive values. So I said, okay, if it's um, less than one, just set it to zero or something like that. Or maybe I didn't allow them to do anything. But what happened was you would, if you would delete everything, the number constructor returns zero if it's not a valid number. So if you delete all of your characters, you have empty string as the value of that number input, and it parses that to zero. Yep. So that was annoying because when you delete something, you expect it there to be nothing. So then I tried to go down uncontrolled inputs, and I couldn't for the life of me unit test it and figure out how to just set that number input and then submit my form. So was it a was it a so it was a real HTML5 number input? Uh, it was a form control element through React Bootstrap. Okay, so we have a, we've had a similar issue with um, floating point numbers in our uh-huh. React Native app. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Brandon gets it. Um, so basically, what you would imagine is if you want to enforce a floating point number in a text field, or I guess it's really a floating point field at that point, you would try to type in one two three point one two three. But when you hit one two three and then the point, that's not a valid float because it's yeah. like yeah. a dot just in the in the middle of nothing. Um, and so then parse float, if you had that in your uh, change handler, would say that's not a number, and then it would just fail and explode and stop working. So Brandon seems to have the answer for this quandary. Well, I have one one answer. There might be better answers. Well, maybe I have a couple answers. So the first one, and maybe the naive approach, is to like debounce that. So like, don't parse it until the user's done typing for some definition of done. Um, I've seen some people and some projects that have uh, gone that route and it's been fine for them. But what I've been partial to recently is using on focus and on blur uh, events as opposed to using the on change event. So what that means is instead of getting the state every time the user adds a new character to the input field, you just get it once they move on to the next one or not necessarily move on to the next one, but blur the input or or it change focus to something else. So we tried that and it had... um questionable results on react native inputs oh interesting yeah not good so what did you do instead so we decided to just have everything be a string and then when the user was done with this current form step we would validate all the inputs and make sure they were all in the right format if they weren't they'd get you know the red text error message and otherwise it'd be fine Uh aha yeah we've we've done that as well yep so you validate on submit kind of a thing yeah um so my my ultimate solution to this number input was i realized any input regardless if it's a number or text stores it as a string Mm -hmm. so when its value is so i was using value as number for a little bit and that was seeming that was weird so because when you when you delete uh all the numbers in a number input it becomes not a number which is number type but uh, it is falsy, so you can make some assumptions there. So is empty string is also falsy. So I have a little if condition um, where if the value or if there's no value, just set the state for that state ID to be empty string. And then React is happy somehow, even though it's going through TypeScript as a number, but it's also sometimes an empty string. But it just works. So, hey, there we go. <laughs> exactly. So that was my funkiness today. I never could figure out how to unit test dom element stuff with just an enzyme i'm sure there's just some methods somewhere i just need to look into the docs more but. so what it what, like in in terms of testing components like what's your philosophy at this point in your early career of react i just keep thinking of angular js it's but it's <laughs> it's weird because in angular js your views are your html template files which I had gone down the pattern of never touching with unit tests uh-huh. yeah. and I was only testing the controllers. Right. Now, earlier in that app, before we touched every bit of code, there were some tests that were using the Angular compile service, which does then touch your your views and you can then expect things based on the thing that's rendered. But that was very cumbersome and it broke pretty easily. So we stopped doing that. 
Now with React, we I test the actions and reducers. Um, we have acceptance tests or end-to-end -end tests, which I'm just starting to write now. And then we have the tests on the components. So unlike your JSX or in my case, TSX files. So are your component tests snapshot tests? Um, I'm using Enzyme, so I'm shallow rendering them. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are wrapped with Redux for Connect, so then I dive in and I expect that certain props are there, or certain text or some regex matches some text that I expect to be there, something like that. Yep. And then I kind of handle all branches of the component. So for this uh, input, I am simulating the on change event and simulating the on submit event, which handles all of the state setting and um, action or reducer dispatching. Nice. Um, I have to say that like component testing has always been, uh, you know, kind of a mixed bag for me. Yep. I think enzyme has always been something that was really intriguing, but I, I it never really kind of took hold as like a, a thing that I, or at, at least some things that I've worked closely on it always felt like the the bigger issue was kind of to either unit test or yeah i guess unit test is probably the best phrase to unit to to unit test the things that operate upon the data than it was necessarily to to manage those those mappings because hopefully there were you know quote unquote hopefully there were other like invariants there to help with the way that things rendered that said um i've been working more on getting snapshot testing going uh, using uh, the te React test renderer and some stuff now that I've moved the test suite from my main project onto Jest. And it's been pretty solid. But I, I'm still not 100% super satisfied with what component testing has yielded. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this as the test suite that you're writing now, Brian, kind of grows over time because that's, you know, that's something that I, I've never really been able to be involved with a, a code base that has really comprehensive component tests. And I'd be really fascinated to hear like how that turns out, how things change over time, and what you find it, it, it works for. Yeah. Now, I don't know how my React project is structured or if it's the best way or not. So, for example, one of my components, which uh, displays this debugging information that I was talking about earlier, at one point I realized I couldn't or I was posting a JavaScript object to the API. And the API was reading it in as a string which meant I couldn't stringify it or I couldn't parse it as JSON no. to display it. So I, after, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I put, put an update in the U, in our main app UI to stringify it first, which is fine. So now I have a try catch in my admin tool component. So it tries to parse it. If it fails, then it just displays it as a string. So that's the kind of thing, like, should that be done in the, well, that should be in the component because it has to do extra stringifying. It can't really... Yeah, I couldn't do that in my reducer. So it's, you know, little things like that that I feel like I really need to test and make sure that it's working correctly. Yeah. When there's a try-catch involved, that's kind of a thing you feel like you need to do. Absolutely. Also, we have code coverage tools that are enforced. So if I didn't test any of my components, I simply would not be able to deploy. So that's why I don't believe in those things. Well, uh, this is company web policy. It's, well, okay, I could probably figure out how to do, ignore lines from coverage, but that's not really... Uh, sustainable long term especially if it's a tool that others may be eventually working on or looking at so i'll go back to uh, brandon's quandary with the component testing so we're doing we're doing unit tests component tests functional tests and end-to-end -end tests of our react native app and that's a lot of tests but uh, our component tests really boil down to being snapshot tests and they're pretty much not useful so snapshot tests is that kind of where you, you give it a path, basically, and you check that it's right. You do something else. You check that it rendered the right thing, or what do you mean? So what you do, what you're supposed to do, and so this is why it's not very useful. So what you do is you run your snapshotter. You go look at the snapshots and see, like, hey, does this look like what I want? And you could, in theory, programmatically trace through it. But really what you're supposed to do is when you feel like you're done with a dumb component the presentational component, you look at the snapshot and then you save it into source control. And then in the future, whenever you run your test suite, the snapshot will run again and get a new snapshot for you. And if they're different, that means you failed. And if they're the same, that means you did it right. Okay. I think you've talked about this 
in the past. So this is like a representation of a virtual DOM. Exactly. Kind of in- okay. It's a little bit more uh, verbose than a virtual DOM. It's like a virtual JSX data DOM. Okay. Yeah. It's a weird structure. Like you can see JSON objects and arrays and stuff in it. But it's yeah, not weird. really any of that. Yeah. No, it's not. So it's like the output of an enzyme element dot debug. It could be. Maybe. I'm not, well, I think not it's just sure. A big old string, but yeah. Okay. So in, and and so basically the the value of those things has not really become super apparent to me yet. Um, it's just not that useful. Well, it's it's you know a third of the testing that I know. So, I'll yeah I can let you guys know in a little bit. And it seems pretty valuable to me. I can also grab the instance of the component and I can call methods on it directly. Nice. So I can do a little more traditional class type testing too. That's awesome. I think like um, I, I I should amend maybe if I if I said that it it didn't seem super useful. I think like the biggest thing is I haven't had a a chance to work on something where that particular kind of testing was prioritized, and as a result, I don't really know what the results would be. I I think I'm generally for component testing, but I I I, I think it's a positive thing. I just don't. I haven't seen. I haven't really interacted with a code base that's had really mature component testing. So I'm, I think it's interesting to see how it turns out. I think it's in a really weird place right now because since Jest and its component uh, snapshot testing came out, like everybody's kind of confused about what it's supposed to really get you. Well, uh, Brandon, if you really want to get into it, just enforce 90% code coverage in both like statements, branches, lines, and functions and then just say well i gotta do it <laughs> oh man i ne- i would be out of commission for three weeks Ever. working on Ever. that yeah no just just forever <laughs> well i guess i guess uh having a full pipeline that does and good templates is motivating me to keep that up well, i mean i i have to if i want to deploy so. no totally i think that's super crucial i think you know one of um one of the most disheartening things I see when I work on a project with somebody else is when they're like, I'm just going to disable the tests for a little while because it's breaking for something, you know, for something vapid. Because once you, once you turn that off, it all of a sudden becomes much harder to get the tests to work again. Oh, that's horrible. There's some product that one of my coworkers works on that has a linter hooked up. That's got eight, seven or 800 warnings and errors. No. And I'm like, right. Talk the code base could really use a linter. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Talk to me about uh, uh, next time you do a, a React Native app that uses Flow. Talk about 400, 400 Flow errors that are in your dependencies and therefore unresolvable, and possibly hiding other Flow errors. You you don't you don't look at your dependencies Flow errors. Hide them. Don't look at them. Ah, but if you hide them, then they may be hiding error like Flow errors in your you code. That's not how it works in theory. In practice, I mean. Yeah, it sounds theory. like you should use TypeScript instead. Hey, uh, maybe coming soon. Maybe. Speaking of which, so this app uses TypeScript. It's kind of neat. <laughs> I uh, I've had to use a couple casting as any, and I feel really dirty. But I really don't know how to solve the problem. With some with some weird like double high order component wrapping. Nice. Oh, sure. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. I can't test with. So there's the React router. Four. Yep. Yeah, that's the newest one. When I wrap a component with with router, and then I have that wrapping a connect, I the the types of the props just fall apart, and I could figure it out, but then I couldn't get it. I couldn't do my component testing with the with router connect with the what I called it the routed connected component. Wow, what a name! And that I I couldn't get to work for passing in the. St- redux store as a prop as well it just threw up typescript things it totally worked it just didn't satisfy typescript so i cast it as any and then it and then it was fine yep. <laughs> and then i tested i no uh sorry there was some weird i couldn't use a route or a link or something without it being in a router but i didn't i don't know it just it wasn't working so i just tested the component one rather than the router one and Things are working. Well so, so does that mean you have all three exported from your file? Uh, yeah, I think I do. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> I only use the con- I use the route routed component or routed connected. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
the the double one I use in the actual app, and then I test the component or the connected component one in the unit in the component test. Nice. Yeah. So uh, I mentioned connect. That's how you get Redux things in a component, and Redux is pretty cool too. It's a nice global app state. I really like that. It's like it just brings a bunch of built-in things. So um, like the the response from that debug information. If I click to another page and then go back, it's just there because I pull from app state. And um, I just have a, a check that renders null if it's like the default value. So then it, you know, the first time you're there, it can be like, okay, I'm going to type in what I want, hit submit, and then it comes back. But then you can go away and come back, and it's still what you submitted last. What if you refresh? Then it's the default state, but that's okay. Unless, unless you use Redux Persist. Which did what recently? Change their entire API. You betcha. Does that go through local storage? <laughs> yeah, it, uh, does. it can if you wish. It can. It also does on use the browser. It does crazy stuff on mobile. Huh. I think you can use IndexedDB if you want too. Yeah. I totally had never even thought that, that could be a thing, but it's so obvious and right in my face that of course you could just dump your state to local storage or something. It's yeah, pretty it's awesome, wonderful. except for when it doesn't work. Exactly. Or, or when it breaks something really bad. Right, right, I don't right. think I have a reason to use it at the moment. Part of my app state is like a user, which has certain access levels, and I want to be able to get the most up-to-date version of that. Now, I'm sure I could like join in things and splice them together. But yeah, one one of the one of the biggest things, or one of the biggest things, when I integrated Redux Persist with a project that I was working on, is making sure that certain things were not persisted. And one thing that I that I've done in the past we were we basically just like rolled our own persistence layer using async storage and some other stuff uh on the react native side uh and moving that to redux persist was really awesome because it's like omg there's like this community consensus api that recently just totally changed but whatever yeah um that's that's react for you yep but they they thought through a lot of that stuff for you and it's it's nice to move from something like that was kind of uh hand rolled and bespoke to something that that's kind of been settled upon by the community at large even if that settled upon thing has changed but that reminds me brian um so when working with a redux store it's usually one of the first things i ran into at least was how to ru- how to run things that were like asynchronous um HTTP requests or even just like the results of promises how do you incorporate those into your redux store or fire them off as a result of a redux action yeah so i'm using the um we have a react typescript template that the same guy who gave the training wrote um there's another one too that's based off of uh what's what's from the big one react something or other it's a standard uh javascript react template and it's got a lot more features and that uses sagas and things and that looked just more complicated, so I went to the React TypeScript one, which uses Redux Observable. Nice. So it's async is based around RxJS, which I had seen a little bit in the other main app that I work on. Uh, it no longer has any RxJS in it, but it did at one point. I thought that was a lot later weight, so um, the guy who made the this template uh, has a whole Ajax client wrapped around the uh ajax feature of rxjs so we can do things like an http interceptor which can log successes or errors Um, and then we use the concept of an epic which i think is part of redux observable so you basically call an action it it wraps basically it wraps the observable object with um an extra thing so you can pass in of type which just checks the type property to contain a string so you can do your, you know, your reducer filtering. And then it you can call an action or you can call something else on it. So we often do like a switch map, which then uh, returns your um, Ajax observable. And then you can map on that and then it'll kind of complete the action. But um, it's nice using like switch map because it means if you submit an action again before that ajax comes back your browser just cancels the http request nice. and it just says screw that we're going to the next one now i don't think that flows back to the api api or anything but at least your browser stops and it should make it a little more lightweight and that seemed kind of nice totally um so i've used sagas before which uh are like observable or like redux observable or like epics 
I think like a saga is to a generator function as an epic is to an observable. Correct. Um, I, I whenever I work with or, or talk to somebody who's not like super deep into the reactor redux world, they're like, "What, what is an epic? What is a saga? What is a thunk?" And it's like it's a pretentious name somebody made up for a really simple concept you're already probably pretty familiar with. So like the the thing about sagas or using using generators as your async middleware is that that cancelable stuff becomes really kind of nasty. And I think Redux Saga has gotten a lot better about this in recent months. But for example, only recently did Redux Saga change so that errors thrown in a saga will now bubble up and need to be handled at the root saga level. It used to be that error, you know, if you, if an error was thrown, it would just silently, like the saga would silently die, which is uh, undesirable to say the least uh, and really tricky to debug. So I think it's Redux Observable definitely seems to be the most ma- mature of uh, the Redux middleware, I would say. Yeah, I really, er, I really like it. Um, it has kind of a similar thing with the error handling. Uh-huh. So you need to you need to have a catch on your... So we at least have an Ajax client, or otherwise if you just do uh, RxJS observable.ajax, I think, maybe. I don't remember. Um, but if, if you catch that Ajax call, then you can um, um, return a new observable of the error that's the pattern we've gone with and then you can map that and you kind of map on the response status if it's 200 or whatever else you want you do the normal thing otherwise you return the error um action but if you don't catch on that ajax call and you instead catch on like the switch map it will it will error the correctly the first time but then it will break your entire epic until you reload the application because it doesn't return the right type, so it doesn't have. It returns. Uh, it returns that caught exception, but it's not of the action type, which is the thing that Redux Observable kind of wraps around ArcGIS. So there's no, you know, type property or payload. It's, you know, you're you're basically returning one level deeper than you need to be, so it breaks the whole chain. That's unfortunate, but I, I got you. It's definitely a, a tricky problem. It sounds like for um, many Redux middlewares. Um, yeah, but this reminds me, I want to look back at the recent changes that Redux Saga has been making in that regard. So yeah, that's React. It's fun. I recommend it. Redux is cool. TypeScript is, is, uh, is pretty neat too. Awesome. I'm sure we'll be talking about this more in future episodes and IRL and on Twitter. Very likely. Totally. Everywhere. All of the places. Uh, well, I've got some kind of interesting news. Uh, yeah. In a couple of months, in the middle of April, I'm going to be presenting with my friend and coworker, uh, Mr. Max Thorson, at Mini WebCon, which is a conference that takes place over uh, at the McNamara Alumni Center at the beautiful University of Minnesota campus. Uh, I'm really psyched. Uh, it's it's this is going to be like my first conference presentation, I guess you could say, and clearly done a lot of stuff with JavaScript and men and things in the past, so. I'm You've never done anything with JavaScript. No way. Are you sure? I think he's used like Flowscript or something weird well, like that. Do, is, is Brandon the organizer of um, CoffeeScript MN? <laughs> yeah, that's that's totally it. That's the yeah. one keeping the dream alive since <laughs> 2012. Um, you know, it actually, it reminds me, uh, uh, somebody really awesome who, who I admire quite a bit was like, hey, uh, I want to give a talk, but it's going to be about, it's going to be called um, Stop Using Coffee Script, and it's going to be about Webpack in, uh, Webpack in Rails. Um, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> oh, no, no, totally. You should, you should absolutely give that talk. And, uh, and he was like, I'm not going to do that. And I was like, well, tsh, jeepers. I think you should give a talk that's titled that. Yeah, I know. I Stop Using that. Coffee Script. Uh, I think I might call it "Stop Using Coffee Script," but then the the rest of the content of the talk will be totally unrelated. Well, for a better meta joke, then it's about Java. <laughs> Good oh, one. No. Script, no scripting Java. <laughs> oh, so good, so good. Well, anyhow, this actual talk uh, that I'm going to give is all about um, getting started with AR and AR Kit. Um, we're going to talk about AR Kit, AR Core, and using using Unity. Uh, and the the Unity AR Kit plugin and the Unity AR Core plugin, as well as touching on some other stuff related to like Lens Studio, 3D modeling, because like what we've really found is that while if if you want to work at the like bare metal level that um, uh, pun partially intended 
of metal and uh, and swift and like uh, scene kit and such. You c- totally can do that, but you know, Unity and Unreal have these really awesome plugins that allow you to get a lot of the benefit from um, you know the the six degrees of freedom that AR Kit will give you, for example, and the the you know plane identification sort of stuff. Even if you're using a plugin like for Unity or Unreal, uh, and as a result, that kind of takes away a lot of the um, a lot of the stress and really a lot of the boilerplate that you might have going into an AR Kit uh, or AR Core app. Uh, particularly Unreal Engine's doing some really sweet stuff with like making an app basically be like a you can kind of drop in replace AR Kit and AR Core, which is re- like exposes a similar interface regardless of which platform you're building for. It's not currently live yet i don't believe but it was it's really interesting when i when i heard about that unity is trying to do something similar with the unity xr platform so we're going to be talking about all sorts of stuff like that we've done a bunch of different ar things in the past couple months so uh it should be really sweet great cool hope it goes well yeah thank you thank you i'm sure we'll do some free advertising later (laughs) definitely well i think it's time for the our favorite segment of all time the new Twitter followees. All right, so excited. Uh, so I will. So Brandon, Brandon followed seven thousand people in the past month. So <laughs> here are three. Here, here are three <laughs> of those seven. Here, here, are, here are three people I haven't followed. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so the first one is a podcast. Uh, you might be familiar with podcasts, as this is one of those. It's a podcast called Tools Day. That's run by uh, Uno Kravitz and. Chris Dunaraj from Netflix here. Those two are really awesome folks. You might remember uh, Yuna from uh, IBM and DigitalOcean. Uh, now she's at Bustle, where she's the director of product design. Uh, and Chris is a senior UI engineer at Netflix. Um, Tools Day is a really awesome podcast. I've, I've listened uh, to it from, from time to time here. I really like it because it's kind of short. It's like 20 minutes. Remember the uh, underscore like David... Perfect, perfect length. Yeah, right? Remember that underscore David Smith podcast you had for a while, developer Developing Perspective? Um, yeah. Did yeah. you guys ever listen to that one? I did. Um, I, I was a huge fan of that because of that um, of that kind of length requirement. And admittedly, I've, I've started listening less and less to tech podcasts, which is an awful thing to say on a tech podcast. No, uh, it's fine. But, Me too. Don't worry. But here I am. In, in part because like I, I really kind of thirst for that kind of content that's a little bit smaller um rather than like i I found myself kind of already steeped in a lot of this stuff in non-podcast form you live it every day i I live it every day so as as a result like when i when i'm listening to a podcast like it i like it to be kind of in that format and plus uh yuna and chris are really cool folks so uh if you haven't heard that check it out next up is at uh black room sec who is security uh kind of professional who I heard about from a couple of my friends in the Minneapolis InfoSec community. Um, she's super awesome, and um, like one of the reasons why I think is uh, she's a really cool person to follow is because um, she's currently studying for the OSCP, uh, which is like a, a security professional certification, and um, one of my friends is also studying for the OSCP. So it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really cool like, process to hear about, um and plus like she's just a cool person to follow so uh definitely worth looking into and last but not least is at urbit u-r-b-i-t and this one's kind of interesting i think i might have posted about this in our slack but it's like a i don't really know how to describe it effectively which kind of makes it a difficult maybe maybe not uh the best choice i've had for a new twitter followee but uh urbit is kind of interesting because it's I believe it's based on the Ethereum network, and it's like a, a way for you to demonstrate that you have control over a piece of computing infrastructure. The way that they describe it is that they have this really succinct description that's like, if Bitcoin is money and Ethereum is law, Urbit is land. Um, Whoa. I know, right? And it's like, hmm. that's a lofty statement, and I don't know what that means, but it's kind of interesting. Um, but the, the way it works is um, you can kind of get you get an address and an address is you know some number that maps to apparently some strange string of characters and you can create subunits or sub addresses of that so it's it's kind of like dns in that way it's it's all about being kind of federated and distributed and it's it's interesting and i'm kind of intrigued to see where it ends up well i followed not too many people in the last month ish i think it's been 
five, six weeks since our last episode. Five weeks. But uh, SpaceX had their awesome Falcon Heavy launch, which I saw in the lobby of my work. I put it up on the big like 12-foot lobby display nice. that I worked on uh, over a year ago. And it was awesome. There are a lot of people just big smiles on their faces myself included so i followed spacex finally i've been following elon musk for a while so i thought it's probably time i follow spacex um sad server is the next one that uh we've probably mentioned before i feel like i followed this account twice already but i followed it again specter server is what it's called i think didn't it used to be its location is in the dark cloud <laughs> one of my favorite tweets in there is, is twitch plays vim yeah <laughs> <laughs> how do i escape <laughs> there is no escape exactly what is this a macbook pro circa 2017 so and then uh finally someone uh, a friend of mine who i know from college he he's a comic artist and he makes cool comics he goes by ice cream sandwich you can find him on twitter at icy sandwich guy and every so often it's a de- there's like a developer related one because he's also a software developer nice that's all folks for me i actually have some twitter followees this time i know it's unusual but i do so first here we have Nathan Taylor. A couple of weeks ago, like I was just clicking around and suddenly I found this really cool um some kind of challenge website that he worked on called spaced.nathan.tokyo and it has a bunch of CSS transitions and JavaScript stuff and it's really cool. It looks great, really like it's it's clearly over the top, but it's really cool. It's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Um and then his personal domain website nathan tokyo is um unusual um the dog is cute that's all i can say um so next i have and i i can't do names so pavel Oksokanov, maybe so this guy more writes, confidence sure uh, none none whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> so this guy writes um one of the libraries that i use in my react native apps called react native router flux and so that's a uh, lot of words it is a lot of words and only some of them are relevant i'm not sure where the flux <laughs> part comes in uh probably in the capacitors well <laughs> exactly but, so there's no time travel and i don't understand why there's no time travel yet give it time yet right okay so i just didn't make it yet um so he, he's really cool um and so he works on this um uh, you know, you know, there's there's not too many routers for React Native, and this is one of the the few that are out there, so it's kind of cool. Uh, so let's see. Next, I have this Twitter followee who works on React Native at Bear, uh, Airbnb, Devin Abbott, and so he does something with React Native, and so of course I must follow him. You must. That's that's how it works. Truly, right? it is the only way. And then I have a bonus Twitter followee for you today. Um, so over the weekend, I was bored, and I um, stumbled upon this guy, whose name I don't actually know because it's not listed. It's just the account is called Live Overflow. So instead of Stack Overflow, it's Live Overflow. And so I guess what he does is streams, not like malicious hacking, but like guides to exploiting weaknesses in code. So uh, he has a YouTube channel that he does all this stuff on. And it's really cool. So he there's there's these things called CTFs. I don't know what that stands for. Uh, but capture the flag, I think. Oh, sure, that makes sense. Yep. I don't watch games or TV. I, so, I also do not. <laughs> Nor do I. So, except a little bit of the Olympics these days. So there's this competition that somebody makes, and so the idea is to um, you know use the vulnerabilities that are present in typical code and you know, stack overflows and many memory manipulation and byte encodings and all sorts of weird, cool stuff. And it's really amazing. Like, so you can go watch some of the videos and you're just, you're just so, it's so amazing that any of the stuff we make actually works and that people aren't breaking into it left and right. That's what I have. Well, I think that's about does it. Um, you can find me on the internet on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, Brian M dot me. And you can find me just about anywhere, but especially on Twitter and Instagram, where my name is Brandon underscore I'm in. Uh, if you're interested in Snapchat, I have that exact same name, uh, where you can see things like uh, pictures of strange jars of fluid that was sent to my office for purposes of testing stuff. 
Uh, t- testing whether <laughs> electronics will run in them. Ah, uh, okay. There's the context. Ah, uh, yes. You know, uh, I might just redact that phrase. <laughs> I don't uh, even even though you added the context, I still don't know if it's actually better. You know, it is no better. But suffice it to say, there's a company that makes some very interesting some very interesting liquids, and these liquids you can run computers in them, uh, or so I'm told. Um, <laughs> so you're told. So I'm told. I haven't. I haven't seen it work yet. Um, oh, and la- yeah. last I heard, uh, a display kind of got a little bit mangled uh, when it was <laughs> submerged in said said liquid. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. But that's what my Snapchat is about, pals. That's what my Snapchat's all about. That's very interesting. And you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryanmar, and of course on my website ryanmarpersed dot com. Have a good one. Have a good one. See you next time. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk36. Because the only thing that works better than actual access control is public humiliation.